I first met Carla Thomas at a business meeting in the city. As assistant manager, I had flown in for the day along with the president and the treasurer of our company, both of whom were to stay over for a convention while I returned to mind the shop. This tall, conservatively dressed woman, a senior vice president of her firm, presided over the meeting but left most of the talking to others. Being the junior in our group, I had little to say, though I listened attentively as each person spoke his piece. Just as I shifted my gaze from one speaker to the next I realized suddenly that her eyes had been focused on me. As our eyes met her left eyelid dipped in a very deliberate wink. Fascinated, I continued to glance covertly at her but she gave no further sign of noticing me. Later, as the meeting was breaking up with handshaking all round she asked, Did I understand that you are flying right back today? Yes, my flight leaves at 6. In that case I can offer you a lift to the airport. It's on my way and I'll be leaving in 15 minutes. Thus it was that I found myself descending on the elevator to the parking garage with a woman who, in her high heels, stood a whole head taller than myself. That head was crowned by beautiful auburn hair framing regular features and a creamy complexion. Her even white teeth showed behind her slight grin as her blue eyes looked down at me. When we left the elevator she took my elbow to guide me to the door of her red lotus. Once we were seated in the car and she had maneuvered it expertly out into traffic, I dared to ask why she had winked at me during the meeting. No particular reason, just I think you're cute. Beside you I feel like a midget. I replied. How tall are you? Five foot five. Does that mean you wouldn't date a girl as tall as me? I'm 5'10". I don't mean that. It's just that it feels strange looking so far up to a woman. I'd be more intimidated by your position. Vice president of such a big firm is pretty important. Lately there haven't been too many men in my life. Maybe they are afraid of my position. Instead of dropping me at the terminal she drove into the parking area. I'll join you for supper, she said simply, without asking a buy your leave. This is a business lunch and you are my guest, she added before directing us into the VIP area. Later on the plane, I reflected on her skill in the restaurant. She had neatly had me accepting her suggestions for expensive choices from the menu, and she had unobtrusively arranged to sign the bill before I could protest. I was flattered to feel that such a high-powered woman executive had taken such pains to impress a lowly assistant manager such as myself. Imagine my further surprise on arriving home to find a package from the florist between the doors. It contained a single red rose with a message on the card reading, Thank you for a lovely time, Carla. Chapter 2 A week later I received a phone call at the office from Carla. Dale, she began, may I ask a big favor? I suppose so. What is it? You won't be angry when I ask it? Of course not. This is beginning to seem very mysterious. Well, there's this customer of ours from the West Coast. He's very taken with me, but I don't want to get mixed up with a married man. He's in town for three days and wants me to go out with him on Friday night. I told him my fiancé had asked me to the opera that night. Then he went out and bought tickets and wants us to be his guests. So what's the problem? I asked, a suspicion beginning to form in my mind. I don't have a fiancé. Would you be my date if Epsom Industries pays for your air travel? Air, I'm very flattered. Just a minute while I check whether I could come. I stalled for time while I gathered my thoughts before answering. Yes, I could catch the four o'clock plane. That gets to the city at 5.15. Wonderful. I'll wire the air tickets right now. Thank you so much. You're a lifesaver. Thus late Friday afternoon I descended from a jet at the city airport. The stewardess had delivered a message that I would be met by the company car and chauffeur and that a room had been reserved for me at a luxury hotel in the name of Epsom Industries. Darling! Carla exclaimed as she approached me with open arms when we met in the hotel lobby at 7.30. She drew me to her. Somewhat startled, I brought my arms around to match her embrace while she initiated a kiss. 
I so appreciate you doing this for me, she whispered in my ear just before we broke away from each other. Then aloud she added, Dale, meet Henry. Henry, this is my fiancé Dale. Henry insisted on hosting our trip to the concert this evening, so I finally accepted. I hope that is all right with you, Dale? If it pleases you, my darling, I replied, still overwhelmed by the greeting I had received. We walked the two blocks to the theater, Carla between us, but holding my hand. Henry was taller than her and it would have looked as if he were her escort and me only a tag-along if she had not made such a point of including me in the conversation. As we sat watching the show she placed my hand in her lap and entwined our fingers. In spite of her friendly conversation there was no way that Henry could fail to appreciate her clear message to him that she reserved herself for me. For my part one found her actions extremely flattering, in spite of the fact that they signified nothing but her desire to properly impress an important customer while keeping him at arm's length. Henry took us to a restaurant before putting us in a taxi back to my hotel where Carla's car sat in the parking lot. She promised to pick him up at 11 the next morning and drive him to the airport. Would you care to spend the night at my place? She asked as we entered the hotel. I, uh, uh, don't think that's fair to you, I stammered in surprise. That's all right. I like you for that answer, smiled Carla. Since you are my date though, I'll see you to your door. As we approached my room I tried to express my appreciation for the evening while wondering if I should invite her in. The pleasure has been all mine, she replied, you have been a real friend to do this for me. Now, will I pick you up tomorrow before I take Henry to the airport, or after I get back? You don't need to feel responsible for me. I can find my own way to the airport. Nonsense. You are my guest, and in case you hadn't noticed, your return flight is not until Sunday. By the way, do you like hockey? Our firm has a box reserved for the season. We could use it. I haven't seen an NHL game except on television. That's settled then. I'll pick you up just after lunch at 1 o'clock. That way we will have Henry out of our way. Good night then, Dale, she added, reaching out to take my right hand in hers. She drew me quickly toward her and before I realized what was happening I received another tender kiss on my lips. Then she abruptly turned and strode down the hall. I slipped my key in the lock and entered the room. Lying in my bed before sleep came I pictured Carla in my mind and thought back over our friendly intimacy of the evening. I knew that I wanted to see more of her, but would she want to see me when she felt her obligation was paid off? Saturday afternoon she was dressed casually, slacks and sweater with low-heeled sandals. Hi, she greeted me as we met in the lobby. Where to this afternoon? Bowling? A movie? The zoo? You choose. You're the hostess. In that case we'll go bowling. I haven't been for a long time. At the alley we seemed evenly matched. I managed to beat her by two pins on the first line as she failed to score in the final frame. When this situation was repeated in the second game I became suspicious and started to watch her performance critically. I became convinced that she was deliberately holding back to let me win. Finally, I said as much to her. You know you don't have to lay back and let me win. Do you think I would do that? I'm not sure but it seems funny that you only get behind in the last frame each time. I'd never admit to such a thing, but you're a dear for suggesting it. Don't you know that I am a high-powered businesswoman who is always beating men at their own games? She beat me handily in the next two lines. Will you still like me if I beat you at bowling? I like you whatever. Do I dare risk playing the rubber match with you? I just like your company whoever wins. The final game was close, but I finally won when a teetering pin which failed to fall spoiled her spare. There, you can't say I planned that, she commented. Anyway, I don't mind losing to you. I like you too much to compete with you. I tried to pay the bill for the bowling, but once more I found she had outmaneuvered me, this time by paying in advance. When I finally succeeded in paying for our supper at a hamburger franchise, she protested. Naughty! Naughty! 
You know you are my guest. Why do men always think they have to pay? It's just as unfair as if I did not bowl my best just to let you win. At the hockey game she proved to be a knowledgeable fan who did not need to have all the whistles explained to her. She certainly knew as much about the game as I did. Later, sitting in a restaurant booth with me, she began to talk quite seriously. Would you be angry if you knew that I could have handled Henry without you, that it was an excuse to arrange a date with you? After a moment of silence she added, would you come to the city for another weekend to be with me? Unless I were paying my own way, I'd feel like a gigolo. She looked downcast, but that's just it, you probably can't afford it and I can. Why not think of it as if you were a young girl being courted by a rich man? You make me feel like a virgin needing a man of the world. I had to admit that all of her arguments were valid, but still it did not seem right to me. Finally she said in exasperation, I am inviting you to come to the city the week after next, but only if you agree that I can pay the bills. Otherwise we won't see each other again. Yes or no? When I hesitated she added, no more buts, just yes or no? Yes, I finally agreed. There, that wasn't so hard to say, was it? Now I'll escort my young virgin back to her room so she can get a good night's sleep, and we'll be ready when I call at seven in the morning to take her to the airport. As a final gesture of independence I grabbed the restaurant check and paid it with a flourish. Carla only smiled. When she had escorted me to my hotel room door, once more I received a sweet goodnight kiss. Chapter 3 Two weeks later I again landed at the city airport. A note from Carla and a small package were waiting for me at the ticket counter. The note contained directions for finding her lotus on the parking lot and directions for finding a particular apartment in a downtown high-rise. The package contained keys. The luxury apartment was tastefully and completely furnished down to soap and towels in the bathroom and milk in the refrigerator, but the furniture, curtains, and bedding looked brand new, and I could find no evidence that revealed anything whatsoever about the regular tenant. I had just managed to complete my shower, shave, and dress by seven o'clock when Carla arrived, precisely at the time mentioned in her note. On the way out she led the way to the passenger door of her lotus, and I thought at first she meant for me to drive, since I still had the keys. Instead, she held the door for me to get in. We dined at the Imperial Room at prices which I must confess would have been far beyond my limited means. Having agreed in advance I did not protest when she placed her credit card on the tray with the bill. After the floor show we danced a little before driving back to the apartment. As on the earlier weekend she escorted me to the door, but did not accept my invitation to come in. This has certainly been a memorable evening for me, she said. I hope you have enjoyed being my date. Thank you for a lovely time, she added as she drew me toward her for a good night kiss. Later, lying in bed, I remembered that this kiss seemed fractionally longer than before, but perhaps a trifle more intimate. I wondered what it all meant. I certainly was fond of Carla and she seemed very taken with me. Why had she turned my question aside when I asked who was the regular tenant of this apartment? She simply said it was not in use, so I might as well stay here. Saturday, we golfed in the morning, bowled in the afternoon, and again went to the hockey game in the evening. After the bowling she suggested that we should both go to the apartment to freshen up before supper. She had brought along a small suitcase with a change of clothes. Before we left again she suggested it was too bad I couldn't cook, because it would have been nicer to eat together there than to go again to a restaurant. That evening she again left me at the apartment door after a good night kiss. Except for a quick trip to a neighborhood delicatessen I spent Sunday morning quietly in the apartment reading the weekend papers. Carla arrived at noon. She declared herself delighted with the sandwich lunch which I had set out. During an afternoon spent walking in the park she extracted a promise from me to return in two weeks' time. Back at home Carla continued to fill my thoughts. How could I deal with this girl who was so obviously out of my financial league? I hated to accept her financing of our time together, but I hated even more the thought of not seeing her. 
Twice Carla phoned to say she missed me and wished I were in the city with her. On the day before my next flight a note arrived suggesting where I would find her car at the airport and that I should come directly to the apartment to meet her. Keys were enclosed. At the apartment door she greeted me with a warm kiss and immediately led me to the living room for a cocktail before dinner. Hadn't we better get started for supper? I asked when she began to refill my glass for the second time. In a little while, I have some presents for you first. Presents. It's not my birthday. Don't spoil my fun, I wanted to buy something for you. She produced three boxes from behind her chair and placed them on the sofa beside me. The first contained a pair of gray suede shoes with narrow somewhat raised heels, obviously expensive. The style was somewhat more extreme than I would choose for myself. At her urging I tried them on and walked across the room. They were a perfect fit. They really don't go too well with your brown trousers, lamented Carla. Open up the other parcels. Soon afterward she shoved me into the bedroom to try on a new gray velvet suit and dark gray silk shirt. The clothes fit me perfectly. Later I learned that Carla had taken measurements from my clothes in the closet while I had showered that previous week. However I felt they were far too effeminate for me. I would never have chosen anything like that for myself. The velvet trousers required no belt and the pockets were small. The long-sleeved shirt was designed with a roll collar and instead of buttons in front had a zipper down to the left shoulder. The suit coat had no lapels. A short string joining two buttons was provided to link a single buttonhole on each side of the jacket front. As I looked at myself in the mirror it dawned on me that these clothes were almost a perfect match for what Carla was wearing, except that hers were blue and she had on a skirt rather than slacks. The word unisex came to mind. Carla was delighted with my appearance, but I was apprehensive about appearing so dressed in public. I was at a loss for words in trying to express my feelings without offending her. Oddly enough she seemed to understand my embarrassment. In case you are nervous about the unisex look, we can eat at a drive-in where you won't have to get out of the car. Much to my relief we met no one in the corridor or the elevator to the parking garage. I was happy to sit inconspicuously in the car while we drove. Carla pulled into the only free parking space, one at which the car hop approached from the passenger side. Good evening, ma'am. What would you like this evening? Startled, I could feel my face turning red as I gave the order in my lowest voice. Afterwards Carla drove to a movie theater. Because of the drive-in incident it took her five minutes to persuade me that it was dark enough that no one would pay us any attention going into the theater. Unfortunately for me it turned out that the entrance corridor past the ticket booth was well lit and I was again addressed as ma'am. This time I only mumbled no smoking and followed the usher. As soon as we were seated Carla took my hand and squeezed it in hers. I'm sorry, Dale, she offered, I hadn't meant for you to be embarrassed. It really is sweet of you to humor me. You know I really like to please you, I answered. We continued to hold hands until it was time to leave. As we filed out the doorman spoke, first to Carla, then to me. Good night, ma'am. Good night, ma'am. We hope you enjoyed your evening. Do come back again. Carla yielded to my entreaty to go straight back to the apartment. To my surprise, instead of leaving me at the door, she herself suggested coming in for a nightcap. You will have to mix it yourself if you are in a hurry. I have to get to the washroom. I did not dare to go while we were out. Feeling much relieved I returned to the living room where Carla was ready with a drink mixed and the record player on. She had taken off her jacket and insisted that I remove mine also. We talked a bit, danced to slow music, kissed, then sat together holding each other close. I had begun to think we would progress to the bedroom when Carla suddenly sat up and announced that she really must leave. Before going out the door she added enigmatically, I think I know the answer to our problem. Will you try an experiment tomorrow? What experiment? I'll tell you tomorrow. Just say you will do it. You won't be sorry. Well, if it makes you happy. It does. 
Now give me a kiss to seal the bargain. Chapter 4 Carla arrived in the morning just as I was about to climb into the shower. I slipped on my bathrobe to answer the door. Hi, here's our breakfast, she began, handing me a small bag of groceries. Put these in the kitchen. I see I got you up. I was just about to take my shower. Well, you go ahead while I fix the table. You haven't forgotten your promise, she said while I, still wearing my bathrobe, sat eating my cereal. What did I promise to do? I said I would tell you later, but for starters you can put on your new suit. Are we going out? Yes, but you can wear your top coat while we walk to the car. At her suggestion our coats were placed in the back of the car before we left the parking garage. She drove to the parking lot of a large shopping center and stopped in an area away from other cars. Then she turned toward me. Our experiment is simple. You are embarrassed by being mistaken for a woman when you are wearing these clothes, but if no one could recognize you, you would have nothing to be embarrassed about. So we will change your appearance. With that she reached under the seat and brought out a flat jar. This is pancake makeup, like actors use. We'll spread it over your face so we can change your complexion. When I am finished you won't recognize yourself. Are you going to give me a false mustache, or a beard? I could, but I don't think it will be necessary. She quickly spread the cream over my face and forehead, rubbing it in with her fingers and wiping off the excess with tissue. Now, I want you to close your eyes and keep them closed while I work. For the next five minutes I sat still or turned my head according to her directions. Various things which I could smell but not see were rubbed or daubed on my face. I was shushed each time I began to say something. Particular attention seemed to be directed in the area of my eyes. Now I will slip this hat on your head. I could feel the band around my head and it felt as if it were pulled down over my right ear. Hold your lips steady now. Something which felt like a brush passed over them twice. Squeeze them against this tissue. Now a final bit of powder. Just a minute more while I arrange the mirror on the back of the sun visor. Now you can turn to the front. Open your eyes, and voila! Looking out at me from the glass was the face of a young woman, neatly but not extravagantly made up. A gray tam sat on the head and slanted over one ear. I stared at the strange image, too shocked to say a word. Well, asked Carla at last, do you think anyone will wonder whether to call you Miss or Mr. now? I don't know what to say. This isn't what I thought I was agreeing to. But you did agree. Now turn this way again and I will put some polish on your fingernails. When this had been accomplished she closed up the cosmetic case which she had been holding on her lap and slid it under the seat. Keep holding your fingers out for the polish to dry while I drive closer to the shopping center. Why are we going there? We'll have to get you a few accessories to complete the picture. To begin with you can't be reaching in your pocket for a handkerchief. We'll have to get you a purse. As we parked near the mall entrance I was given further instructions. Walk slowly with short steps. Don't try to hurry. Just stick close to me. Keep your voice down and let me do the talking to store clerks. Here, put my purse under your arm until we get you one. Be sure to hang on so it could not be jerked away from you. Carla got out of the car and came around to my side. She opened the door and took my hand as I stepped out. I'm nervous. It feels like everyone is looking at me. There's nothing to worry about. Here, I'll drop my keys in the purse and we'll be off. Hesitantly I fell in beside her and we proceeded into the mall. At the first store we came to, Carla led the way to a jewelry counter. I watched as she looked through the collection of clip-on earrings. She held several up beside my face to examine the effect. Finally she chose a large red pair. She proceeded then to match these with a red necklace and a red bracelet, both of which she tried on me. Satisfied with her choices she led the way to the checkout counter where she paid with a credit card from her purse. Outside the store she made me stand still while the earrings were clipped on my ears. 
The necklace and bracelet were quickly added to my costume and we continued along the mall corridor with me feeling all the more conspicuous. At our next stop I received a red leather purse into which the items from my pockets were dropped. In a small wig boutique Carla carefully studied the samples before selecting three to be taken into a mirrored cubicle. Her choice remained on my head while the sales clerk clipped it a little, then brushed and sprayed it. I enjoyed looking at my altered appearance as reflected from the mirror. The tam was dropped in a shopping bag and we continued through the mall, my head now crowned with magnificent blonde hair. Nervous though I still was, my eyes kept turning to catch my reflection in the store windows we passed. Carla stopped in front of each lady's wear store and asked my opinion of the dresses which caught her eye. I tried to non-committally avoid showing very much interest, but did answer when appropriate, no, I don't like that, or yes, that would look good on you, Carla. We were sitting in a small restaurant finishing a coke when she asked if I were feeling warm and would I be more comfortable without my suit jacket. Yes, I answered without thinking and began to undo the button. Hold on, interjected Carla, that will take some preparation. Let's go into the department store next door. Half an hour later she led me into a women's washroom where, with my jacket off and my silk shirt carefully lifted over my blonde curls, a black bra was fastened around my chest and breast forms were carefully tucked into place. Then a lacy black camisole was dropped over my shoulders and my shirt slipped back on. Now sit back down and put on these stockings in place of your socks, added Carla, handing me a pair of nylon knee highs. The combination of Carla's presence in the enclosed space and the silken clothes suddenly began to affect me. As I pulled up the stockings I could feel the beginnings of sexual arousal. When I tried to stand up I was betrayed by a telltale lump at the front of my trousers. Carla noticed at once. Oh, oh, you can't go out like that. You wait here. I'll be back as quickly as I can. Don't forget to latch the door. With that she slipped out, leaving me to sit by myself for what seemed forever. I could hear others coming and going from the washroom, but fortunately no one tried to enter the extra-large cubicle for the handicapped where I was ensconced. At last I heard Carla's voice speaking softly from the adjacent cubicle. I looked down to see her hand holding a small parcel under the wall. Put this on and then meet me out front. The parcel contained a black pull-on panty girdle which, at first glance, I was sure would never go around me. Nevertheless, after some tugging I managed to adjust it so that I felt secure against the risk of another telltale lump in my trousers. Finally released from my cubicle prison, I joined Carla beside the wall sink and mirror. Take your compact out of your purse and freshen up the powder on your nose and around your chin, she instructed. I followed her directions, surprised to find a large silver compact which she must have placed in my purse when my attention was on something else. Now, freshen up your lipstick. Careful strokes. Like this. She demonstrated on herself in the mirror next to me. Now blot your lips with a piece of tissue. As I looked at myself in the glass I could feel the need for the girdle holding me securely in place. I was dazzled by my own appearance. My face was impeccably made up and framed by smoothly curled hair. Red earrings, necklace, bracelet, and fingernails matched my lipstick and contrasted with my gray silk blouse. Bra straps and the lace of my camisole were faintly visible through the semi-opaque material. My narrow waist was rendered more distinct by the taut waistband of my slacks, falling smoothly over my girdled hips. Yes, you do look lovely commented Carla as I stepped back from the mirror to experience the whole effect. Reluctantly I turned to follow as she led the way back into the mall. Just in time I remembered to take my purse along. After a trip back to the car to drop our jackets, our next stop was a shoe store. Before entering I was cautioned to speak in a low voice. Still much aware of myself, but not quite as nervous as before, I could not help noticing the eagerness with which the young salesman served us. I thoroughly enjoyed the attention he lavished on me as I was fitted with a pair of red pumps. Carla wisely restricted my choice to medium heels which, though they felt strange, I managed without difficulty. For the rest of the day my changed posture from the higher heels kept me constantly aware of my altered appearance. 
For lunch Carlo led the way to a department store cafeteria. I felt more anonymous in that busy atmosphere. She made no comment about my uncharacteristic choice of a salad plate and coffee with no dessert. Afterward another trip to the washroom was made to freshen up powder and lipstick. I was very hesitant when Carla suggested our usual few lines of bowling. I only agreed provided it be at a different alley. I hated to change my new pumps for low heel bowling shoes. I was constantly aware of the eyes of several male bystanders as I delivered my balls. I felt my face redden with a blush when they clapped for my strike which won the second game. Too flustered to continue, I fled to the washroom. With powder and lipstick once more restored, I changed back to my red pumps and we left the alley. I'm sorry I got so rattled, I apologized to Carla. Don't let it worry you. It's just something you have to get used to, she replied. Too bad though. You were really bowling well. Anyway, let's take a drive. I should make a call to pick up a few things. Chapter 5 A half hour later we drove up to the front door of a large house set back from the road in a wooded section of the suburbs. Come in, said Carla, hopping out of the car and leading the way into the small portico. She pushed the buzzer, then opened the door and stepped inside. Are you home, mother? she called. A tall stately woman, an older version of Carla herself, appeared in the archway. Carla! How nice to see you! Come right in. Mrs. James is here. We're just having a cup of tea. Mother, this is my friend Dale. She is in the city for the weekend. I was almost too dumbfounded to speak, but mumbled something as Mrs. Thomas shook my hand. It is a pleasure to meet you, Dale. Do come into the living room. Still somewhat shocked, I managed better with the introduction to Mrs. James. Soon we were all chatting amiably as we waited for the teapot. Most of the conversation centered on Carla and her career, but I was called upon to explain where I was from and that I held a minor executive position, not really comparable to Carla's. The latter helped me out by steering the conversation into other channels, but not before Mrs. James commented on how different things are nowadays and what opportunities young women have today. All would have been well and we would have left after a short time had it not been for a spilled cup of tea. It slipped from Mrs. Thomas's fingers as she passed it across my knees to Carla. Suddenly my thigh was soaked with hot, wet liquid. Ooh! I squealed jumping up and pulling my trouser leg away from my skin. How clumsy of me, apologized Mrs. Thomas. Carla, take Dale upstairs and find her one of my skirts to wear while we wash and dry her slacks. Shortly I was sitting on the edge of a bed wiping the red spot above my knee with a towel. Carla delivered my slacks to her mother for cleaning, then returned to find me a skirt. Why not slacks? I inquired. Mother never wears them, she replied, handing me a floor-length black half-slip. Put this on quickly before anyone sees your hairy legs. A black silk evening skirt with straight lines and a full hem was found to complete my costume. As I stood in front of the mirror that thrill of recognition returned. It looks as if I were going to a dance, I whispered. You'd be the belle of the ball, was the immediate reply. Back downstairs Mrs. Thomas made no comment on Carla's choice of a skirt. We sat down to complete our tea party with myself very conscious of the rustle of silk about my legs. I'll have to send your slacks to the dry cleaners. That's the only way to be sure the stain is properly removed. You'll have to wear my skirt home and I'll have Carla return your slacks next week, she proposed. Oh each, you shouldn't bother. No, I insist. Having said goodbye to Mrs. James, Carla asked her mother for the parcel she had come for. Before we could get outside the door however, Mrs. Thomas was asking us to stay for supper. It's almost five now. Your father will be home at 5.30 and will eat right away, no later than six. You'd like to stay, wouldn't you, Dale? Ah, it's whatever Carla says. Carla yielded to her mother's pleading. Good. I'll go stick the meat in the oven. I turned to Carla. What am I going to do about my face? My beard will soon show through my makeup. 
She led me upstairs to the bathroom. Here she tied a towel around my neck and then carefully lifted off my wig. With her help my makeup was removed with vanishing cream and tissue, except for the eyeshadow and mascara. She produced a safety razor and shaving cream so I was once more able to clear away the sprouting whiskers. Within 15 minutes she was again powdering my face over a layer of pancake makeup before restoring my wig. For the first time I observed the process of transforming my visage into that of a beautiful woman. The thrill was just as great as that first look in the car mirror, but this time it did not frighten me as much. I followed Carla back down the stairs just as Mr. Thomas arrived home. Carla greeted him at the door and introduced me. There was little time for conversation however as Mrs. Thomas rushed him off to freshen up, saying that dinner was about ready to serve. Carla and I went into the dining room to set the table with the good china as directed by her mother. Ten minutes later we sat down to a delicious home-cooked meal, to which I did not really do justice. Nervously I accepted only small servings in spite of the urgings of Mrs. Thomas, explaining that I was only a small eater. Carla, who knew that this was not always true, looked at me strangely, but did not comment. When we had finished our tea, my suggestion that I help with the clearing up while Carla could chat with her father was quickly endorsed by Mrs. Thomas. She immediately produced an apron to slip over my head and stepped around behind me to tie it. There, that will guard against any further accidents, though without Carla in the kitchen, you're probably safe anyway. Mrs. Thomas babbled on about how her daughter had never been much for kitchen chores. Between us we soon had the kitchen in order and the dishwasher loaded. Then she volunteered to write out the recipe for the chocolate dessert which I had said I enjoyed. After hanging up my apron I took the proffered recipe paper back into the living room to put in my purse. Carla and her father were having an animated discussion about business affairs. He broke it off to turn to me. Thank you for staying for supper. Carla comes to see us so seldom. It was a real pleasure. You wife is an excellent cook. Dale is taking my recipe for coconut fudge pudding, interjected Mrs. Thomas. I looked at Carla who managed not to smile. Do you have anywhere you must go this evening, Dale? asked Mr. Thomas. I've been trying to persuade Carla to stay for the evening. She more or less said it depends on you. Well, I, I began, trying to catch a clue from Carla. We could have a first-rate game of bridge. Get out the cards, Martha, and we'll show these young people how it's done. Thus we spent the evening playing cards. Remembering back I can admit that it was fun, in spite of my nervousness and the difficulty I experienced in concentrating on the game. I found myself constantly thinking about my appearance and thrilling to the feel of the silk skirt draped over my legs. By 10 o'clock I pleaded exhaustion from a long day, and after another lunch and tea found myself again in the car with Carla. You were fantastic, she enthused. I never expected our experiment to go so well. You certainly impressed my parents. They think you're a real lady. I wish you hadn't taken me there. It wasn't fair to fool them like that. What would they say if they knew? She had no answer for my question, but continued to talk of our experiences as we drove. Back at the apartment she did not stop at the door, but came inside saying, it would not look well for two girls to be seen kissing in the hall. As soon as the door closed we were in each other's arms for a long tender passionate kiss, the most intimate by far to that time. Carla withdrew first. My darling little virgin, she whispered. We must protect you from yourself. I don't want to be protected, I whimpered. Nevertheless, I am not going to let things go too far. Take off your jacket and come into the bathroom. I'm going to help you remove your makeup. My wig and jewelry were carefully removed and I followed directions for creaming off the makeup before scrubbing my face. Now brush your teeth and then into the bedroom to change for bed. When you are under the covers I'll be in to give you a good night kiss. She retreated to the living room while I wrestled with girdle and skirt to use the toilet. That done I slipped into the bedroom reluctantly to undress, laying each piece of clothing on the chair as it came off. 
I could have been quicker, but I paused to feel the smoothness of each article as it was removed. Are you ready yet? called Carla just after I had taken off every article of women's clothing. Just a moment. I slipped out of my jockey shorts and pulled on my pajama bottoms, then the top, and slipped under the covers. Okay now. She entered the room, looked at the pile of clothes, and proceeded to hang things in the cupboard. Then she turned and instructed me to put my arms under the covers. She leaned over to tuck the covers around my shoulders and neck. Good night, Dale. You were marvelous. I hope you enjoyed the day as much as I have. Now go to sleep. I'll see you at lunchtime tomorrow. Her lips touched mine lightly. I tried to insert my tongue between her lips, but she would not let us reach our earlier passion. Her hands held the covers around my upper arms so that I could not reach out to embrace her. She stepped back quickly, then turned and left the room. In a moment she appeared in the door again, this time wearing her jacket. Now close her eyes and off to sleep. She switched off the light. I heard her footsteps cross the living room floor and the click of the latch as she closed the apartment door behind her. Chapter 6 I did not want to fall asleep as I lay there wanting Carla and thinking back over that exciting day. How long I lay awake I do not know, but I must have slept soundly at last, because it was the bright sun shining on my face which awakened me about 10 in the morning. I rushed into the bathroom for a quick shower. Then without shaving, I hastily pulled on my ordinary clothes so I could slip out to the delicatessen for lunch ingredients and a newspaper. I was almost out the door when the red glint of my fingernails caught my eye. Damn! Frantically, I searched the pocket of my topcoat for gloves. None to be had. It was too early in the season. I rushed back to the abandoned purse from which I had already taken my wallet, keys, and money. No nail polish remover. Nothing in the medicine cabinet either. I sat down again to await Carla's coming. Then I thought of band-aids. The package in the bathroom yielded just four so I wrapped them around the thumb and three fingers of my right hand to cover up the red. After a moment's thought I tore two off and rewrapped them on the thumb and first finger of my left hand. My hands stayed in my pockets on the trip to the store. At the counter three fingers of each hand were carefully folded under, leaving only thumb and forefinger showing. I paid for my packages and carried them away. What a relief when I finally found myself back in the apartment without having been asked any embarrassing questions or enduring any funny looks. By the time Carla arrived I had finished shaving, had the table set, and was sitting reading the paper, still very conscious of my red nails. I jumped up to greet her with a kiss. She held me back from her before our embrace could become as passionate as I wished. Ah, I see you have lunch ready. You're a real darling. I'm famished. After lunch we talked about our experiences of the previous day. I repeated again how nervous I had been, expecting discovery at any moment. Carla admitted she had tricked me into it, but professed not to be a bit sorry because it had been such a marvelous experience. I complained about meeting her parents. Now I would not be able to meet them as myself. Carla confessed this had not occurred to her when she had, on impulse, taken me there. Actually, I meant only to slip in and get my parcel while you waited in the car, but it just seemed so natural to bring you inside. We talked on for quite a long while until she had coaxed from me the admission that I had enjoyed the adventure. Very much? She asked. Yes, I answered slowly, dropping my head and raising my eyebrows toward her. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Can we go for an afternoon walk now? Only if you help me remove this nail polish. I explained my earlier problem and how I had solved it. She was very apologetic about her oversight and not telling me that the bottle sitting in the medicine cabinet and labeled banana oil could serve as polish remover. I took it for granted you would know that. The offending color was quickly removed and we had a delightful walk in the park without any further discussion of my masquerade. Later in the day, however, just before we parted at the airport security, she had another request. You know that Halloween is only a week and a half away. Of course. 
I have been invited to a party next Saturday night. Would you agree to come with me, as a girl? Well, say yes. Please, Dale. Well, okay. Just to please you. It does please me. We'll start to get ready on Friday night. Goodbye now. She drew me toward her and we had another deep passionate kiss like that of the night before. This woman could really turn me on. The promise in that kiss stayed on my mind all during the flight home. Chapter 7 Carla arrived earlier than usual at the apartment the next Friday, before I had finished my shower in fact. Just put on your dressing gown and come into the living room, she called. We met for a long sweet kiss in the center of the room. Then she led me to the Chesterfield to sit down. One of her hands lay on my knee. Without preamble she asked at once, would you let me set your hair tonight so you could go without a wig tomorrow? Well, I could not think of an answer. Don't we have to go out for supper? We can have supper sent over. She leaned over and kissed me again. I could feel her hand on my knee. Say yes, please, Dale, she added when we came up for air. Would it please you that much? Okay. I'll cooperate. A few moments later I was sitting on a stool in front of the kitchen sink with a towel around my neck. I had to bend over the sink while my hair was first shampooed and then rinsed with the kitchen spray. A home permanent kit was brought into play and by the time supper was delivered my head was covered with curlers, around each of which strands of my hair were tightly rolled. While we sat eating at the kitchen table the bonnet of a portable dryer enclosed my head and I found it difficult to carry on a conversation because of the sound of the warm air blowing around my ears. Later she tied a silk scarf over my curlers. That can stay on until bedtime at least. It would really be better to leave it on till morning, but I don't suppose you would want to sleep in curlers. When I rashly answered that if it really pleased her I would do just that, I was rewarded with another kiss and the words, You really are sweet, Dale. She added, We have another problem, you know. What's that? Your legs. You can't wear a skirt and nylons with hairy legs. Resignedly I responded, I suppose not. I'll get the razor. I was made to stand on a chair while Carla scraped the hair from the lower parts of my legs. Fortunately I had thought to put on my undershorts under my kimono. Now, you go into the bathroom and finish above your knees. Call me when you're ready. I'll come and shave under your arms. By bedtime my face, neck, and shoulders had been creamed, lotion had been rubbed into my hands, and my toenails as well as my fingernails had received a coat of polish. She wanted to pluck my eyebrows too, but I refused. At my suggestion we paused for a cup of tea, but Carla left it for me to prepare while she went into the bedroom. At the table she explained, I've put a satin pillowcase on the bed so you will be able to turn your head during the night. Even so your head will likely be quite uncomfortable. You really are a brick to do this, she added. With tea over, I was sent to get into bed while Carla washed up. In a few minutes she came into the bedroom. I was lying under the covers with my head on the pillow. She had been right about it being uncomfortable to sleep on curlers but I was determined not to complain. She took a couple of hangers out of the closet and hung them over the door handle. My pair of red pumps were taken out and set on the floor near the chair. From the dresser drawer she took some items which I could not see and laid them out on the chair. Then, holding a small package in her hand, she came over to the bed. I don't suppose you know how to put on pantyhose, she said, tearing them out of the package. You put your thumbs into the toes like this. Put them over your toes and pull them carefully up to your knee. Then do the same with the other leg. They go over your panties. Your panty girdle goes on over top. She turned and hung the pantyhose over the chair and dropped the plastic wrapper into the wastebasket before coming over to sit on the edge of the bed. I pulled my hands out from under the covers and placed them in hers. We sat silently facing each other and holding hands for several minutes. Finally she shifted forward while I lifted my head for a gentle kiss. She drew back quickly, then rose. I must go, darling. You need your beauty sleep. 
We will be all day shopping tomorrow. I'll be over by 8.30 and I want to find you up and dressed. Don't touch your hair or your face, except to shave. I'll help you with your hair and your makeup. Sleep came slowly as the discomfort caused by the curlers kept me constantly shifting position. Finally, I lay on my stomach with my head turned only enough to keep me from smothering. My mind kept churning with thoughts about the morrow. I was at the same time both frightened and thrilled. Before eight in the morning I had completed shaving, odd to do it with a silk kerchief over my hair and red fingernails on the hand holding the razor, had creamed my face and neck according to instructions, and was sitting on the edge of the bed ready to dress. First came the black bra and the fitting of the breast forms, then very dainty nylon and lace panties. The pantyhose went on in the manner prescribed. How I enjoyed running my fingers up and down my clean-shaven legs, before, during, and after donning the hose. I stood in front of the mirror while pulling the girdle into place with some difficulty because of sexual excitement. A new black full slip slid over my head and down over my body. With my red pumps on my feet I turned around before the mirror, enjoying the sight of myself in lingerie. From the hangers on the closet door I took my grey silk blouse and a narrow grey velvet skirt in the same material as my slacks and jacket. With these in place I hurried to make the bed and tidy the room. On the kitchen table was a taffeta apron which I donned before setting out the breakfast dishes and cereal. All was in readiness for the arrival of Carla. She greeted me with a warm kiss but resisted my efforts to prolong our embrace indefinitely. Our breakfast conversation consisted of the recitation of my fears about the impersonation, punctuated by her constant reassurances that everything would be perfect. After all, last week was a total success without any preparation on your part. Are you aware, she asked, that you have kept your voice perfectly modulated during this whole conversation? With breakfast over and the kitchen tidied, we proceeded to comb out my hair and make up my face, or rather, I did these things following Carla's directions. Earrings, necklace, and bracelet followed. The results pleased us both. What Carla saw and what the full-length hall mirror showed me was a smartly dressed young woman ready to face the world. I would not have looked out of place in an office, on an airplane trip, shopping, or dining in a first-class restaurant. Carla, as always, looked her own attractive self and was wearing the powder blue velvet suit which was identical to my outfit except for size and color. The details of that day of shopping are still clear in my mind and the feelings I experienced were exquisite. Carrying a purse and the vigilance required to keep it safe began to feel quite natural. Being addressed by clerks and strangers as ma'am no longer surprised me. Guarding the tone of my voice did not present any real problems. We must have visited a dozen dress stores and three or four dresses were tried on me in each. It was fun to be in the fitting room with Carla, and a surprise to me to learn that we could leave without buying anything. Finally the choice was made of a dress for me which Carla felt would be suitable for the party. At my insistence we picked out one for her as well. Then there were stops to buy matching lingerie in both our sizes, followed by a visit to the shoe store where I acquired black pumps with heels a full inch higher than before. Our shopping spree was interrupted by a number of trips back to the car to stow parcels. When sprinkles of rain interrupted one such journey, it led to the purchase of an umbrella, as well as a nylon satin waterproof topcoat with hood in an exotic yellow color. Black silk gloves and scarf were chosen for contrast along with knee-length black high-heeled rain boots. Choosing matching silver jewelry was done with me trying the pieces individually before a mirror. A matching wristwatch was chosen before we left that store. I remember clearly that the last item for which we searched was a purse. When we at last found one on which we could both agree it was almost 5 p.m. and we hurried back to the apartment. We had been shopping continually since 9.30 with only a brief respite for lunch. I was beginning to feel a strain in the back of my legs from the unaccustomed walking in high heels. Chapter 8 Back home I wanted to sit and rest, but this was not to be. I was ordered to remove my clothes and shower for the second time that day with a shower cap over my head. Off came the makeup and the razor went over my face once more to be sure that there could be no telltale shadow later in the evening. 
That done I donned my bathrobe and reported to the bedroom. There Carla had laid out my fresh wardrobe on the bed and I was to dress while she showered. My efficiency in dressing was greater this time round but my pleasure in the process was undiminished. Each matching piece of nylon satin and lace was a shimmering gray in color. The labels called it silver ice. In a few moments I was again eyeing myself in the full-length mirror, running my eyes down from my neatly set hair to my knee-length slip, my patterned hose, and my high-heeled pumps. After my makeup had been reapplied, and the chips on my nail polish repaired, Carla helped slip my new sleeveless dress over my head and closed the back zipper. My jewelry was added and the final touch was a bit of spray to hold my hair in place. I prepared us a bowl of soup, not forgetting my apron, while Carla finished dressing herself. It did not seem like much of a meal, but Carla declared that we could fill up on sweets at the party. By the time we were ready to leave it was pouring rain. I agreed with Carla that my yellow coat did not go perfectly with the gray silk dress, but the black accessories certainly matched either. I again admired my appearance in the mirror before stepping out the door. Because of the rain I had to carry my shoes in a bag, along with my purse, while holding an umbrella in the other hand. Along the way I wondered to myself, but did not ask, why Carla was dressed as herself and not costumed for what I assumed to be a Halloween party. On our arrival at a house in the suburbs, Carla brought along a couple of gift-wrapped parcels from the car. These were handed to the hostess, who took them into another room while we hung up our coats and put on our shoes. Then we were led downstairs to a recreation room where I was introduced to Mona, and Betty, and Sarah, and Roberta, and Jane, and another Betty, and several more whose names I have forgotten. Carla knew most, but not all of the women present, who ranged in age from teenagers to grandmothers. All were dressed as if for a night on the town. We had barely made the rounds of the group and found seats when someone spoke out in a stage whisper. Quiet, everyone, she's coming. Turn out the lights. We sat in the dark, not speaking while we heard the hostess answer the door and welcome another couple. A few minutes later someone came down the stairs. Where did you say your umbrella is, Rachel? called a voice from the next room. In the rec room. There is a light switch just inside the door. Suddenly our room was flooded with light as a pretty young woman stepped through the door. Surprise, shouted out several voices, followed by a babble of sounds as everyone started to talk at once. Our hostess came back into the room to complete the introductions. A basket of gaily wrapped presents, surmounted by a paper umbrella was placed before the honoree. I found myself seated beside Victoria, the bride-to-be, as she carefully unwrapped each parcel and thanked the donor profusely. In each case the thanks were accompanied by a peck on the cheek. Jokes were made about many of the household articles, often relating them to sex and the life of newlyweds. Some of the jokes I would not have expected from a group of women. I was not surprised to learn that a set of bath towels carried a card saying, with best wishes from Dale. I received my kiss in turn. With the presents opened, the hostess led us through a number of pencil and paper games, all with a wedding theme. Still seated beside Victoria, I was not required to say very much as I could always divert the conversation with another question about wedding plans. When lunch was served I limited my intake in spite of the hunger left from an inadequate supper. At the door later, Carla and I helped each other with coats and boots. Victoria thanked each of us once more for coming, thanked Carla again for bringing her out-of-town friend, and I received a final peck on the cheek. We stepped out into the rain and hurried back to the car. As we drove back to the apartment Carla gripped the wheel with her left hand, holding my silk-gloved hand in her right. Talking about the evening, I realized that I had lost my nervousness early on. Everyone had accepted me for what I appeared and I had enjoyed being a part of the strange ritual. I surprised myself by admitting, that was the most fun I've had for a long time. Our embrace inside the apartment door was long and passionate, but again Carla broke it up while I wanted to continue in progress to more intimacies. She helped me off with my coat and boots but would not remove hers. I don't want to spoil things, she insisted. I want my little virgin to get her beauty sleep. You get off to bed now. 
I will be back in the morning for breakfast. I would be very pleased to find Miss Dale Roberts still here. By the way, I left a present for you on the bed. We shared another deep kiss just before she stepped out the door. On the bed I found several parcels. The smallest contained a hairnet with a note suggesting I sleep in it. In a shoe box was a pair of dainty high-heeled satin slippers. The larger box held a full-length yellow satin and lace night dress and matching dressing gown. Its note said, Dream of me while you sleep in this. Conflicting emotions bothered me as I opened the gifts. What is Carla doing to me? This is wrong, I thought. But I could not resist holding the beautiful gown up to myself in front of the mirror. Ten minutes later I was lying in bed luxuriating in the feel of the soft satin against my smooth skin. Chapter 9 The clock showed 8 as I rushed to the bathroom next morning. Traces of lipstick still showed on my lips as I removed the short stubble from my face. Experimentally, I patted a light coat of makeup over my cheeks and chin. A fresh coat of lipstick followed. Satisfied with my face, I looked down. A flat chest did nothing for my exquisite gown. Back in the bedroom, I slipped it over my head before donning panties and padded bra. When the gown slid back down over my body, I was delighted with the effect. With the negligee added, I tripped into the kitchen on my high-heeled slippers to prepare breakfast. I could hardly wait for Carla's arrival to display my finery. What a lovely lady! And so beautifully dressed. You're a test of my self-control. These words came from Carla as she separated us from our embrace of greeting. Her flattery was joy to my ears though I would rather have encouraged the sexual excitement aroused by our embrace. She avoided temptation by handing me her coat to hang up while she headed for the breakfast table. Afterwards she sent me to the bedroom to dress while she cleared the table. Then, under her direction, my makeup was completed and my hair combed into place. She insisted that we leave the apartment, saying, your virtue will be much safer where there are other people around. I did not feel the same desire to protect my virginity. She no longer sought places to go where we would be anonymous. We attended a church service where I was introduced to the clergyman and to several members of the congregation. By now my strange role felt natural enough that I was scarcely nervous. For lunch we met Victoria and her fiancé. The discussion was all about details of the wedding at which Carla was to be one of the bridesmaids. The two women talked animatedly while, with some difficulty, I made polite conversation with Fred. Carla commented later as we strolled through the park that she thought I had managed very well. I had not been aware that she was paying such close attention. During the same stroll we were whistled at and I received some pointers on how to discourage unwanted male attentions. By four o'clock we were back in the apartment where I reluctantly changed clothes and resumed my male identity for the trip to the airport and the flight home. We had considerable difficulty making my hair lie flat in its normal manner. Finally we resorted to hairspray and I pondered the wisdom of keeping my hat on during the flight. It was not until mid-flight that events of the weekend began to fill me with self-doubt. For two days I had dressed and acted as a woman. Yes, I had even thought like one as I identified with Victoria's wedding plans. I had accepted a female identity which would preclude associating with a number of Carla's friends as my normal self. And for what? I did not seem to have made any progress with Carla. She still set strict limits on the intimacy of our caresses. She supplied all the money for our relationship, and certainly she spent it like water. What would be the total bill for Saturday's shopping spree? This whole thing was totally out of my financial league. The old adage, he who pays the piper calls the tune, ran through my mind. And yet, the whole thing was fun, and I remained totally fascinated by Carla. But could I continue to be her pawn? I ought to break off the relationship permanently. I resolved that I would not return to the city in the near future. That decision taken, I tried to will myself to think of other things and to lift my self-imposed mood of depression. The gloomy thoughts were still present as I slipped the key into my apartment door. Inside the telephone was jangling. I did not hurry, 
thinking that whoever was calling would have given up before I could reach the phone. The ringing continued and finally I picked it up to hear Carla's voice. Hello, darling. I couldn't wait for you to get home. I miss you so much already. I miss you too, my sweet. Her call lasted almost an hour. We were just like two teenagers hogging the family phones. My gloom was lost in the delight of talking to her. My negative thoughts from the journey home received no mention. We parted reluctantly at last and I headed for bed. I slept in the nude. Chapter 10A message reached my desk just before noon on Monday, asking me to phone Carla collect at her office at 1.30. The conversation began with her words. Oh, Dale, I'm so glad you were able to call. Are you alone? Naturally, darling. Would you be able to get off work for the balance of the week? Or at least for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? Probably, I have some holidays saved up. What would it be for? Victoria is here and she needs a big favor. Please say yes for my sake. What is the favor? Just a minute. She's here in the office. I'll put her on the line. Do say yes now. Five minutes later I sat back stunned. One of the bridesmaids had been rushed to the hospital this morning and was having her appendix removed at this very hour. I had just agreed to be the replacement. Chapter 11 That evening I washed my hair thoroughly to remove the brilliantine which had been holding it close to my head and reducing the curl. By Tuesday noon I was back in the downtown city apartment. I phoned for Carla at her office. It was an hour before she could get free of a meeting to call back. Her instructions were brief. Get dressed and wait for me. Don't answer the door and don't go out until I arrive to check you over. Sorry, I can't talk longer. Goodbye, love. I set out to follow her instructions, happily reflecting on her use of the word love in place of my name. The lingerie which I had worn on the weekend had all been thrown into the laundry hamper on Sunday. Carla had said she would take care of it. The hamper was now empty but a brown paper bag with a laundry tag on it sat just inside the front door, just where Carla had left it when we set out for the airport. I was considering what to do about this when the phone rang again. Carla's message was hurried. Your clothes aren't back from the laundry yet, Han, so take a leisurely bubble bath and I'll be over at 4.30. Bye again, love. Again, she used that term of endearment. I smiled happily as I lay back in the warm water. When she finally arrived I had run the razor over my legs and was painting my toenails. I wrapped my negligee tighter about me, met her in the hall for a brief kiss and took the packages she brought into the bedroom. This time my panties and bra were white nylon. I sat down to put on my dark pantyhose, then watched myself again in the mirror as the white girdle stretched over my hips and compressed my waist. Once more I enjoyed the feeling as the white nylon slip slithered down over my body. My gray velvet skirt came next before I called Carla to fasten the semi-transparent white blouse with its lace trimmed down the front and buttons up the center back. Because of the condition of my hair my wig was brought out and fitted into place. Then I carefully followed Carla's directions in applying makeup to my face. Standing in front of the mirror I was just as amazed as before at my total transformation. I was reluctant to call Victoria to tell her of my arrival because of fear that my voice might betray me when not accompanied by a visual impression, but Carla insisted, reminding me that I had spoken to her on the phone the previous day. Victoria suggested that Carla and I should meet her at the hospital where she would be visiting the convalescing Doreen. On the way to the hospital we purchased a bouquet of flowers and a get-well card, but our call had to be kept quite short because of the number of visitors. Victoria left with us and plans for the next day were made over coffee in a nearby restaurant. Carla had made an appointment for me to have my hair set at 9 o'clock so I would not be able to show up for a dress fitting until 11. Victoria would meet me for lunch and afterwards I would shop for shoes, gloves, and any other essentials. These plans made, Carla and I returned to the apartment. Questions about how I should conduct myself on the morrow and at the wedding kept us talking constantly until 10.30 when Carla announced that she must leave. I'll be around to see you off again in the morning though, 
she added. Our kiss was short but tender before I was once again dressing for bed in a silk nightgown. This time I continued to wear my bra to preserve that illusion of womanhood for the mirror. Carla arrived before breakfast carrying another dress with her. I recognized it as one which I had tried on during our shopping spree. It was maroon silk jersey with white collar and cuffs, buttons down the front, and a loose belt. This will be easier to get on and off for the fitting session, she explained. You won't have to reach behind your back to fasten or unfasten it. I was quite pleased with my appearance. My silver jewelry and black pumps matched the dress well, but Carla offered some additional jewelry, saying that I should have a certain amount of variety to maintain appearances. Before leaving she also handed me two plastic credit cards made out in the name Dale Thomas. I was asked to sign that name on the back of each card. Her explanation for the name on the cards had to do with adding additional family members to her accounts. I accepted the cards without comment and after signing dropped them in my purse. On her way to work Carla stopped at the hairdressers. I walked in with an air of confidence which I did not feel to ask about the appointment Carla had made. Oh, yes. You are Dale Thomas, slight emphasis on the name Dale. Come right this way. We can begin at once. An hour later I was sitting under the dryer reading from a women's magazine and wondering how Dale Roberts, male, would be able to suppress the permanent wave in his hair. I had a sense of awe and relief as well that the skilled operator had managed to do so much to my hair without touching my makeup or disturbing it in any way. The last coat of lacquer was drying on the nails of my newly manicured hands when I heard Victoria's voice asking for Miss Thomas. Strange that she must think that is my name. At that moment I realized that I had never heard Carla use my last name to anyone, even her parents. I had always been introduced simply as her friend Dale from out of town. I resolved to question Carla further about this. As we were leaving the operator confirmed that she would come to the apartment personally at 11 o'clock Friday to set my hair for the wedding. Victoria drove us to the dressmakers where I had to strip off my dress for a fitting of the gown already completed to Doreen's measurements. It was a dream of a dress in pastel yellow silk taffeta. My bra and slip straps showed in the large scooped neck and I was told that a strapless bra would be needed on the day of the wedding. Pins were inserted to mark the places that would have to be let out or taken in. Then the dress was unzipped and I stepped out. As I was rebut-toning my street dress I was told to come back at the same time tomorrow for a final fitting. Over lunch in a nearby restaurant Victoria hesitatingly raised another subject. You're not supposed to know this till the day of the wedding, but we are giving each of the bridesmaids matching gold earrings and necklace as wedding presents. They have already been bought and we would like you to wear them during the ceremony. I could guess what was coming. But they're for pierced ears. Can't one pair be exchanged for the other kind? There's no way they would match. Would you do this as a special favor to me, Dale? You could let the holes close up after the wedding. In for an inch, in for a mile, I thought to myself as I pondered the situation. I decided to give in gracefully. The tense expression on Victoria's face relaxed and she smiled. I'm sure you won't be sorry. You're a brick to do this for me. I was scared silly when I had mine done, but it hardly hurt at all. Evidently she thought it was fear of pain which held me back. Don't worry. Now that I've decided there's no problem. Twenty minutes later I was having gold studs inserted in my newly pierced earlobes in the jewelry department of a major department store by a woman billed as a registered nurse. In the shoe department satin covered pumps were fitted and we left a swatch of material so they could be dyed to the exact shade of my dress. Elbow length white silk gloves were chosen at our next stop before we proceeded to the lingerie shop where Victoria helped me to select a narrow waisted basque bra with removable straps and long garters. I did not invite her into the fitting room when I tried it on. With Victoria's advice I purchased two pairs of ultra sheer nylon stockings to be worn with the bra. At 3.30 in the afternoon I was dropped back at the apartment while Victoria hurried off to attend to further wedding details. In the interval before Carla's return from the office I experimented with my new Basque bra and stockings. 
I liked the feel of the garters sliding over my nylon panties as I moved about the room and sat or stood, and the stockings felt sleeker than pantyhose. Unfortunately, without my girdle to provide control, a bulge soon showed through the front of my slip. Nevertheless, I put my dress back on and awaited Carla's arrival. She detected the problem at once during our welcoming embrace and scolded me for taking such a risk. I explained that I had only just tried on the new garments and was awaiting her advice or suggestions. You could try a control panty, she mused, but the only sure thing is a full-length corselet. Just at that moment she noticed my gold studs. Well, I do declare, she exclaimed, pierced ears. My little darling is becoming quite authentic. I explained how anxious Victoria had been to have it done and that I intended to let the holes grow over the next week. Oh, I hope you won't do that. Now, what have you planned for supper? I was forced to confess that the idea of making supper had not occurred to me, even though I had been looking after breakfast arrangements for several weekends and Carla had been dropping hints regularly that she wished I could cook. Oh, well, she said philosophically, we'll run out to a restaurant again, but not before you put on a girdle again to keep you under proper control. On the way back from the restaurant I waited in the car while Carla made a quick stop at a friend's to borrow a mail-order catalog. After that we spent a quiet evening together. She outmaneuvered me by sitting in the only Chesterfield chair and refused my invitation to sit close on the sofa. I can rest better over here. I'm really exhausted from a hard day at the office. She leafed through the catalog for a few moments, then called me over to look at the corselet she thought suitable for me. Too bad the stores are closed on Wednesday night. You will have to choose one first thing tomorrow morning and wear it from the store over to your final dress fitting. We spent the evening watching television with the guide and the remote control on Carla's lap. She thanked me for placing a footstool under her feet, and several times during the evening she nodded off for a short nap. At 10 o'clock I made us a pot of tea which we drank while watching the national news. I haven't been very good company, she confessed. But at least you're still a virgin, she added smiling. You need a good rest, I interjected. Is there no way you can get tomorrow off? It's impossible. I've got extra things to do so I can get away Friday for the wedding. I may even be late for supper tomorrow, and the wedding rehearsal is at 7.30. It's a good thing my dress was all fitted last week or I would have that to worry about, too. Carla kissed me tenderly before going out the door and once more left me feeling frustrated from wanting her. I removed my makeup and slowly prepared for bed. After one last peek in the mirror at myself wearing my dainty nightgown I slipped between the sheets. I wriggled occasionally as I lay there just to stimulate the sensory touch of the silk material. I willed myself not to think of where all this must be leading. I decided that I should take the next week as holidays, to recover before reporting back to work. I turned on my side and hugged the pillow thinking of Carla. Chapter 12 By the time Carla arrived for breakfast I had completed dressing and was putting the final touches on my facial makeup. She pronounced me ready to meet the world and complimented me on my newly acquired skills. She announced her approval of my decision to take the coming week off, but suggested I spend the time in the city so we could be together in the evenings. Once again I fell in with her plans. Because of the late opening time at the stores Carla hurried off to work, leaving me to use public transportation for my first solo shopping venture. This I enjoyed thoroughly, noticing with pleasure the admiring male glances directed at me on the streetcar. Acting on the advice of the sales clerk I chose three corselets which could be worn strapless to be tried on in the fitting room. There I modeled each privately before reaching my decision. The clerk expressed no surprise at my request to again use the fitting room so I could wear my new purchase as I left the department. With some time to kill before my dress fitting I enjoyed a very pleasant hour of browsing in the stores. The dressmaker declared my bridesmaid's gown a perfect fit while I turned to look at myself in the mirror as the zipper was drawn up my back. This time no straps showed in the wide scooped neck. Just a slight correction in the hem is still needed, I was told. You are not as hippie as the other girl. Come back in one hour and I will have it ready for you. 
or you can wait right here if you choose. I opted to browse some more in the stores of the neighborhood and lunched on salad and diet cola before collecting my dress. Then I hurried home to get it out of the box and onto the hanger as soon as possible. With most of the afternoon to myself, here was my opportunity to prepare a meal as so often hinted about by Carla, so I headed for the supermarket. Without a planned menu in mind I must have pushed my cart through every aisle twice and read dozens of labels before heading for the checkout. My selections were limited to things which appeared easy to prepare, but I gathered enough for several suppers and luckily was able to purchase a folding shopping cart to wheel it home. While paying the cashier with money from my purse it occurred to me that this was one of the few times in several weekends that I had spent any of my own money and my worries on that score began again. How could I continue to keep company with a woman who paid all the bills? More importantly a new thought increased my worries. I had come to love Carla, but how could I ask her to marry me if I could not earn enough to support her suitably if she gave up her job to be with me? Or, could I find a job near her work and if so, could I cope with situation if she continued to earn so much more than me? Carla arrived shortly after five to find me busily engaged in the kitchen. I removed my spattered apron to receive her kiss and embrace. Her expression of pleasure about having supper prepared for her was a fitting reward for my efforts. Even more pleasing to me was her comment after supper that I had done an excellent job. That compliment was followed by another kiss. I insisted that she sit and rest while I tidied up the kitchen. At 7.30 we reached the church for the wedding rehearsal. Victoria introduced me to the men in the party including David Martin, the usher who would apparently act as my companion escort at the reception, and John Robinson who would accompany Carla. For an hour the preacher had us practice with organ accompaniment. I was to be first in the slow procession up the aisle, followed by Carla, then the matron of honor, sister of the bride, and finally Victoria on her father's arm. We repeated the routine four times before the minister deemed that everyone would remember his or her place to stand during the ceremony. The men, except for the groom, looked very bored standing at the front while we bridesmaids repeatedly came down the aisle. At 8.30 we all repaired to the home of Victoria's parents where we were served a lunch prepared by the bride's mother and met as well the parents of the groom. Before leaving we each received a present from the bride and groom. In the case of the bridesmaids this was a matching set of gold earrings and necklace. Victoria thanked me privately again for having my ears pierced. I told her that I would always treasure my beautiful gift. David offered to drive me home to save Carla from going out of her way, but I refused his offer and we returned as we had come. In the car a sudden troubling thought occurred to me. Would I be expected to dance at the wedding reception? Carla confirmed that this was indeed part of the plan. But I have never danced the woman's part before, I worried. I shall be tripping all over my feet, and my partner's too. I'm sorry I forgot about it, responded Carla. We'll have to get in some practice as soon as we get to the apartment. So I spent an hour in Carla's arms learning to step backwards and to follow her lead. It seemed very awkward at first, but as my skill improved I thoroughly enjoyed the closeness that developed between us. I glowed when Carla complimented me on my rapid improvement with the unfamiliar routines. I would happily have gone on dancing for hours, but as usual she was sensible and firm in deciding that it was time for her departure. Our parting embrace at the door was particularly sweet and tender. Preparing for bed, I pondered again how much I loved and wanted this attractive woman who had so complicated my life. I hugged my pillow to my satin-clad body, wishing it were Carla, as I drifted off to sleep. Chapter 13 The wedding was scheduled for four in the afternoon, but Carla had the whole day off and we were together from the time she arrived for breakfast, carrying with her a suitcase containing her finery. She hung her gown in the cupboard and joined me for breakfast. I continued to wear negligee and slippers all morning, even after my bath. In fact I was still dressed that way while the hairdresser was present to set Carla's hair and mine. When the hairdresser left I donned an apron over the negligee to prepare a simple sandwich lunch. By 3.30 in the afternoon we had helped each other into our gowns and were giving one another a final check when the car arrived to take us to the church. 
Our long smooth gowns were a perfect match, hers pale green and mine pale yellow, each with cap sleeves and a scoop neck low in the front and back. Our new gold necklaces glittered against our soft skin and the matching earrings dangled from our earlobes. Our exquisitely made-up faces were framed by fresh hairdos with every strand of hair in its place. Long silk gloves extended above our elbows, hiding the carefully manicured hands with gleaming enameled fingernails. Our satin pumps peeking out from the hems of the dresses were a perfect color match. It was tremendously exciting for me to stand beside Carla, my eyes darting back and forth between her and the mirror as I compared us. Certainly I thought, the bride will have to be ravishing to outshine such a beautiful pair of bridesmaids. Carla interrupted my reverie to suggest that I stuff some Kleenex into the top of my dress in case of need during the ceremony. I did so reluctantly. The driver promised to deliver our coats and purses to the reception when he dropped us at the church in bright sunlight precisely at four o'clock. The bride and her father arrived at exactly the same time and we stood nervously in the church vestibule waiting for the organ to signal our entrance. Then, head held high and looking straight ahead, bouquet clasped at my waist, I slowly led the procession down the aisle, conscious the while of the soft caress of silk about my legs. Flash bulbs popped as each member of the procession neared the front of the church. Carefully, I edged over to my place as the congregation's attention switched from the bridesmaids to the bride. Out of the corner of my eye I saw Victoria arrive at her place and the groom turn with her to face the preacher. I thought of Carla as the ceremony droned on and noted with pleasure that she was watching me from the corner of her eye. She winked at me when the minister solemnly intoned the words, You may now kiss the bride. Then it was off to the vestry on David's arm for the signing of the register. I wrote Dale Thomas in a clear hand. David took my arm as we lined up for the final parade through the church to the entrance steps, there along with the entire wedding party, to be showered with confetti while cameras clicked all around us. Still paired off with David I was installed with my long skirt in the back seat of a fancy car for the noisy drive to the photographer's studio. Here we posed in groups under the photographer's direction until he had immortalized every possible combination, even David and me. All the while I was wondrously aware of the tilt to my posture caused by my high-heeled pumps, of the feel of my gown over my body, of the gold necklace circling my bare neck, and of the slight pull of my dangling earrings. Even my hands were sensitive through the silk gloves. Reinstalled in the cars we were driven, accompanied by much horn blowing, back to the reception hall where we were showered with more confetti before forming up for the receiving line. You look lovely, my dear, or words to that effect, and usually accompanied by a peck on the cheek, were repeated to me by virtually all of the women as they shook my hand in passing. Most of the men politely echoed, very pleased to meet you, Miss Thomas, as they squeezed my hand, but several insisted on kissing their way through the whole female part of the wedding party after their formal pack for the bride. In spite of my efforts I managed to remember only a few of the names of the various aunts, uncles, and cousins of the bride and groom who shook my silk-clad hand with varying degrees of pressure. Seated at the head table between David and Carla's escort, John, I enjoyed watching the proceedings. Spoons rattled often for the bride and groom to kiss and once in turn for each pair in the wedding party. Reluctantly I stood in my turn while David bent me back for a kiss which I considered unduly familiar. I had no means to protest, however. Dessert was followed by speeches and a series of toasts to the happy couple, to the bride, and to each bridesmaid in turn. I enjoyed my moment as the center of attention and even more having David stand to reply with a series of remarks about how lucky he was to be paired with such an outstanding beauty. I basked in the flattery. The dance which followed dinner was exhilarating for me. I had almost no time to rest. Following my obligatory round with David, there was a swirl about with each male of the wedding party. Then David reclaimed me. Whenever we slipped aside to sit on the sidelines, I received another invitation. I must have danced with twenty different men or boys besides David who paid me constant court. If I caught sight of Carla on the dance floor she would smile and wink over the shoulder of her partner. During a short intermission we sat at the same table with our escorts but we had no chance to talk. 
About 11.30 the bride and groom left the room to change into their traveling clothes while a lunch was being served to the gathering. On their return all the single girls were lined up while the bride turned away for the tossing of her bouquet. Clapping and cheers erupted when the bouquet flew over Victoria's shoulder directly to me. Who will be the lucky fellow? was a question I declined to answer as I received congratulations for being designated by superstition as the next bride among the group. Chapter 14 With the departure of the bride and groom Carla and I indicated our intention of leaving, at which David and John volunteered to call a cab and to bring our wraps. A few moments later, after noisy farewells, the boys stood with us at the entrance as we waited for the car. Two taxis drove up one after the other. David opened the door and assisted me to step into the first. I shifted across the seat to make room for Carla, but to my surprise David followed me in, closed the door, and ordered the cab to leave. I turned in the seat to see Carla protesting as she was ushered into the second car. David refused to be disturbed by my complaints and instead insisted on holding my hand in his. He explained that the boys knew we lived in different locations and did not wish one of us to be forced to arrive home alone. At my apartment house he insisted on paying off the driver instead of having the cab wait for him as I suggested. Against my wishes he took me by the arm and accompanied me up the elevator, asserting that it was his duty to see me safely home. At the door I turned to him to express the thanks I did not feel for being escorted to my door. As I began he asked, aren't you going to invite me in? No, it is much too late, and besides I have just met you. At least let me open the door for you. Reluctantly I produced the key from my purse. He opened the door and handed me back the key, but held my hand in his. He put his other hand around behind me and drew me toward him before I could protest. I had no chance to refuse the kiss which was firmly planted on my unwilling lips. Terrified that the situation would get totally beyond my control I nevertheless spoke quietly but firmly when the pressure on my lips was relaxed. Thank you, David, for a lovely kiss. It has been a wonderful evening with you, but it must end now. My mother is here and she will hear us. Let me go now. Feeling his arms relax I turned quickly, slipped in the door, and clicked it behind me. Then, after fastening the safety chain, I cracked the door open, held my face up to the narrow space, and pursed my lips as if in a kiss. Thank you again, David. You're a perfect gentleman, I murmured. He pursed his lips and blew a kiss in my direction before turning on his heel. I closed the door and leaned my back against it, relieved that I had regained control of our parting. I was still standing in the same position when the telephone rang. Carla sounded breathless as she asked if I were all right. Yes, I'm fine, I answered. How did you make out? I really tore a strip off that John. He kept saying that it was David's idea to take separate taxis, and that he only agreed to keep the peace. I gave him such a blast that he did not even try to kiss me goodnight. It is certainly a relief to know you're safe. I can imagine just how angry you could get at John. I hope you never get that angry with me. You're different. I'm very fond of you. He's just a friend of Victoria's husband. I certainly would rather have had you come home with me, but maybe it is better the way things worked out. You wouldn't stay here with me, and I don't think a girl in an evening dress should travel home alone at this hour of the night. A lot you know. Maybe I would have stayed after all. I'd like that, darling. So would I, but, oh, what's the use? I'll be over in the morning. Good night, my little virgin. It had been a long, exciting day, and I slept soundly. In fact, I was still asleep when Carla arrived about 9.30 in the morning. I was actually awakened by a kiss and opened my eyes to see Carla's smiling face leaning over the bed. What a lovely way to wake up. Better still, why don't you just crawl in with me? I'm not going to take advantage of my little virgin like that. She handed me my negligee. Here is your robe. Off to the bathroom with you while I plug in the kettle. Ten minutes later, freshly shaved and with my makeup partially restored, I sat down to breakfast, still clad in negligee and slippers. 
I suggested to Carla that perhaps I should consider dressing properly according to my sex. Don't be in a hurry, she answered. We can have a lot more fun with you dressed as a woman. Now that you don't have to go back to work until a week from Sunday, we should continue to take advantage of the situation. And you do everything so perfectly. I'll bet even David did not suspect why you did not kiss him goodnight. How did you manage that, anyway? I told him this is my mother's apartment and that she was waiting up for me. Carla laughed heartily, just as the telephone rang. It was David wanting to arrange another date with me. I did my best to let him down gently, explaining that I was already obligated and that I was not the kind of person who would keep two on the string at once. I did enjoy your company, David, but I do have a steady who would not approve of me dating on the side. Thank you so much for asking though. It's very flattering, and I think you are such a fine person. He was persistent, but finally accepted the message that no date would be forthcoming. As the telephone clicked down Carla stepped over and put her arms around me from behind. You're a wonder, she whispered in my ear. You handled that exactly right. He thinks you're more wonderful than ever, even though you turned him down flat. And what do you think? I asked as I twisted around to face her. My answer was a long, tender kiss. Again Carla ended it before our passions could get out of hand. Our Saturday was spent as on our first weekend together. We visited the bowling alley in the afternoon and spent the evening at the hockey game. The difference was that we now appeared to be two attractive young women. With new confidence in my ability to carry off the role, I thoroughly enjoyed our time together. I found real pleasure in my changed appearance. I remained aware of my dangling earrings even as I was preparing to deliver a bowling ball down the alley. We joked to each other about our effect on the men we encountered, and in my feminine role I was not embarrassed when Carla paid the bills. It was the most wonderful day ever. I confessed as we were saying our tender goodnights. Not as much excitement as at the wedding, but I so enjoy having you all to myself. The feeling is mutual, she replied. Too bad our time together is so short. I really want to take advantage of this week. I hope you will continue to dress for me. You're so much more relaxed now. And you let me do things for you without always arguing about the bills. Dale, I so like doing things for you. But I took the week off to let my hair straighten out and let my ears heal. I'll have to start doing something about it by Monday. I'll get the materials and straighten your hair myself provided you wait till next weekend. By that time your ears will be healed so well that no one will even notice the holes when you take out your earrings. Besides, they won't be hurt by permanent wave solution if we wait that long. You make things seem very plausible and tempting, but no buts. Promise me you won't do anything to spoil our fun before the weekend. It's against all my better judgment. Please do this for me, Dale. When you put it like that it is hard to say no. Then you will do it. Kiss me. She pulled me toward her for a tender embrace and a deeply satisfying kiss. There's just one more condition, I added when we stopped for air. What's that? You'll have to teach me how to wash my unmentionables. Everything I have is soiled. She kissed me again. No problem, my little virgin. I'll help you in the morning. Now let's have one more kiss before I go. Chapter 15 Next morning Carla brought a clean set of her own panties, bra, half-slip, camisole, and girdle, as well as pantyhose which she had picked up in the drugstore. For me it was a particular pleasure to put on garments which she had worn, even if the panties were one size too large. With her help I soon had freshly hand-washed laundry festooned on every available hanging place in the bathroom and more pieces draped over kitchen chairs. I finished dressing by donning my shoes and street dress, then set the dishes in the sink to soak. After a retouch of my makeup we set out for church. On our way out from the service I was pleased to note that the preacher remembered my name. Ah yes, Dale, isn't it? He greeted me at the door. I didn't catch your last name when I met you last week. It's Thomas, I lied glibly, but no relation to Carla. I hope you'll come back again, 
Miss Thomas. No, I'll call you Dale. It's friendlier, he added before turning to shake hands with the next parishioner. We took an afternoon drive to an open-plan zoo a few miles from town. I sat happily in the passenger seat, depending on Carla to find the way. She held my hand in hers as we drove slowly among the free-roaming wild animals within the confines of the park. It was a relaxing day, made more so by my transferring all responsibility to Carla and following her lead wherever she chose to go. After supper at a roadside stop we were back in the apartment by seven. When we had freshened our faces and folded the laundry we spent a quiet evening watching television. During the evening Carla laid out an agenda for the coming week. While she would be at work on Monday, I was to purchase several more articles of clothing as per a list which she handed me. Monday evening we would go to the university to attend a lecture which she was required to take in because of her job. Tuesday she would be late getting back from a business meeting out of town. We would spend the evening in the apartment. I was to purchase tickets for a play at the Opera House for Wednesday evening. Thursday I would drive with her to Niagara Falls where she had a business lunch scheduled. After supper that day we would go to the YWCA pool for an hour of swimming. Friday we would invite two of her friends over for bridge. Do you think you can fill in the rest of the time for yourself? She asked. I'll certainly do my best, I promised. Before the 10 o'clock news she insisted that I change to my nightgown, negligee, and slippers. While I was changing she made a pot of tea which we sipped as we watched the events of the day. Then, as on previous occasions, I was tucked into bed with my arms under the covers before receiving my goodnight kiss. Carla seemed to have an iron will concerning how far our caresses would proceed. I felt very frustrated as she once more bade me goodnight with a promise to see her little virgin in the morning. Monday breakfast was over all too soon as Carla hurried out the door following another heavenly kiss. My morning was spent shopping for the items on her list, more shoes, underwear, and another dress. I postponed the purchase of a bathing suit. One item was added to the list by my own decision a comprehensive cookbook. Most of the afternoon I spent in deep study of that carefully chosen book. Monday supper, which I started early in the afternoon to prepare, was I felt a reasonable success and received complimentary comments from Carla. It was something of a rush to also display my purchases to her and change to my new dress before our departure for the lecture hall. Carla was enthused by the lecture, but I found it hard to keep my mind on business matters. I was too busy mentally planning a super menu for Tuesday's late dinner. That night as usual I went to bed with a deep longing for Carla after she resolutely broke free from my clinging embrace. You're certainly lucky that I'm such an honorable person, she whispered. My little virgin is such a tempting morsel, but I am determined to protect her from herself. If the situation were reversed I know you would try just as hard to protect me. To myself I admitted that I thought nothing of the kind but I did not contradict her out loud. Tuesday began in the same manner as Monday except that I set my own agenda for shopping. I was particularly pleased with my purchases. By early afternoon I was busily engaged in preparations for what I hoped would be an incomparable dinner. With the help of my cookbook I strove to make every dish a masterpiece. I studied the directions again and again to make sure I was making no mistakes. The table I set with a lace cloth and the finest dishes from the cupboard. The small cake which I baked came out of the oven looking exactly like its picture in the book. The icing went on as directed and I decorated it with a heart. My roast was stuck in the preheated oven at the prescribed time and I prepared the potatoes and carrots so they could start to cook at the instant of Carla's arrival. I laid out the ingredients for Yorkshire pudding and studied once more the directions for thickening gravy. With my preparations complete I rushed to the bedroom to complete dressing for the evening. Finally with my face made up exquisitely, long dangling earrings and matching necklace to contrast with my newly purchased dark green hostess gown, I paced the apartment, nervously waiting for Carla's arrival. With the sound of her key in the lock I switched on the burners under the potatoes and carrots and rushed to the door to greet her with a passionate kiss. When our lips finally separated she held me back from her to admire my new gown and jewelry. 
standing at arm's length while she inspected me, I noted her own deep brown velvet pantsuit worn with a tan silk shirt and a red satin ascot. Her hair was upswept revealing gold studs in her earlobes, each displaying a tiny ruby to match the ascot. Once more I was dazzled by the style and beauty of this glamorous woman. I led her to an easy chair and insisted that she sit back and raise her feet onto the footstool. I handed her the newspaper before rushing back to the kitchen for a wine glass and a bottle of sherry. She sipped the wine while I removed her shoes and sat on the edge of the footstool massaging her feet through her silk hose. She sighed contentedly and picked up the newspaper when I had to return to the kitchen. I slipped back once to refill her sherry glass in the midst of my final dinner preparations. When I had turned down the dining room lights and lit the candles I again sat at Carla's feet to slip her shoes back on before leading her by the hand to the table. She insisted on holding the chair for me to sit and kiss me on the cheek before moving to her place. The hi-fi played Chopin waltzes softly while we dined in the candlelight. She expressed delight with everything I had cooked, even the Yorkshire pudding which had disappointed me. I can still picture her face as I uncovered the cake with its heart-shaped decoration. She declared her amazement that I had personally baked and decorated it. The ultimate compliment for me came when she accepted a second piece. We drank our tea slowly while she talked of her difficult day at work. I refused her offer to help and required that she finish her newspaper in the living room while I tidied up and stacked the dishes in the dishwasher. I can't get over how well you managed the dinner, enthused Carla as I returned from the kitchen to join her. And you are dressed so elegantly. You could be entertaining the Prime Minister. The only person I want to impress is you. I like to have you think I am talented. Learning to put that meal together was hard work, but you make it all seem worthwhile. Would you dance with me if I put the right music on the record player? For the next hour we drifted lightly around the room, stopping once or twice to sip some wine. I enjoyed following her lead and we tried out a variety of different steps as the music changed. During the slow pieces she cradled my head on her shoulder and clasped me tight to her. Finally she led me over to the Chesterfield where we sat together in the semi-darkness. Through my gown I thrilled to the feeling of her hand running up my side from my knee to my shoulder, then down my arm to entwine our fingers. With her right arm at my back she bent me over so that my head lay on the armrest and she leaned over to plant a kiss on my lips. I felt her left hand move back up my arm and down my body until it paused just above my knee. It changed to the other leg and slowly started back up. Oh, Carla, I moaned, I love you and I want you so much. Her hand stopped at my hip joint and she slowly raised me back to a sitting position. She took my right hand in hers and with her right arm cradled me against her. I grasped her shoulder with my free hand and offered my lips for another kiss. Her tongue teased itself between my lips, then was abruptly withdrawn. Dale, she began, I want to ask you a very important question. It is so important that I don't want you to answer it at once, but I want you to think it over very carefully first. Will you promise to do that before I begin? Of course, whatever you say, and I tried to renew the kiss. She drew her head back and continued. Dale, I love you very deeply and what I am asking may not be very fair to you. You know that I love you, Carla. What is it you are trying to say? Dale. Would you become my wife? For a moment the full implication of her words did not register on me. She paused before continuing. You know that I am very ambitious and determined to make a success of my career. It wouldn't be possible for me to be happy if I gave it up. Do you mean that you are asking me to give up my career if I marry you? Could you make that sacrifice for me, Dale? Don't answer that question yet. Just think about it. The two of us probably could not live on what you are making, but my salary already is enough for us both and it will get bigger. I know that Dale Roberts is too embarrassed to accept money from a woman, but don't forget that Dale Thomas does not have to feel that way. She can earn her keep the way every wife does. That is my proposal, that you become my wife, Dale. You mean that you want me to continue to dress as a woman, to keep house, get the meals and so on? 
That's it exactly, my little virgin. Promise me that you will consider it very carefully. Her lips met mine again and her hand stroked my thigh. My excitement started to rise again until a frightening thought crossed my mind. But where would I be if the marriage broke up? I would have given up my job and have nothing to go back to. That's exactly what every girl faces who gives up her career for marriage. Yes, but don't say anything more yet, Dale. Just think about it. The kiss resumed and the caress on my thigh began again. A moment later she paused again to ask another question. Would you feel more secure if we signed a premarital agreement? What would it say? Oh, I suppose it would guarantee that if we divorced all our assets would be divided equally. Let's turn the light on and get a piece of paper. I'll see if I can word something. I reached for the light switch reluctantly. For weeks I had been trying to seduce Carla and now at last when we seemed on the verge she was breaking it off to write a contract. She moved at once to the desk, took a piece of paper and penned the following. Marriage contract we, the undersigned, mutually agree that in the event of divorce, all the assets of the marriage, whether title is held by either spouse shall be divided equally between us. She read it out to me and after further thought amended it to read as follows, We, the undersigned, mutually agree that in the event of termination of our proposed marriage by divorce or separation, all the properties and assets owned by either of the parties, whether acquired before or during the marriage shall be divided equally between the parties. Does that sound all right to you, Dale? It means that even my lotus is part of the deal. Will you accept my proposal now? You asked me to think about it first. I can't decide yet. That agreement only says what happens if we don't get along. That's very negative and pessimistic. What are we promising each other so that it never comes to that? Just our marriage vows, I suppose. Isn't that enough? I'm not sure. Let me think about it for a day. I promise you an answer tomorrow evening. You'll keep me on tenderhooks all day tomorrow. I won't be able to concentrate on my work. So much the better. Let's dance some more. She took me in her arms and I rested my head dreamily on her shoulder as we drifted about the floor in a close embrace. The music changed and I was swung about in a fast waltz. The music slowed and I pressed myself tightly against her once more. She whispered in my ear, you're so beautiful and I love you so. I can't trust myself with you. I want you so very much, darling. Let's move to the Chesterfield, I responded. No, she suddenly announced, that wouldn't be fair. I want us to have something to look forward to on our wedding night. But I haven't agreed yet to marry you. So much more important than that you keep your respect for me and realize that I will always do what is right for you. All my pleas and entreaties failed to change her mind. She was determined that her little virgin would be protected from our natural urges. I was forced to settle for a last lingering kiss as she departed for the night. Still sexually frustrated I reflected back over the evening as I prepared for bed. I realized that I had thoroughly enjoyed planning the dinner and arranging our evening together. Carla had obviously appreciated my efforts and said so in words and actions. I smiled to myself at the thought that an evening that resulted in a proposal of marriage could only be considered a complete success. Carla had come closer to losing her calm control over our situation than at any time since we had first met. She had actually fled in fear that I might succeed in seducing her. No, that was wrong. It was fear that I would succeed in having her seduce me. She was playing the role of the strong protector guarding me, the little innocent. But marriage on her terms, what would that be like? The thought still churned in my mind as I lay in bed with the feel of my silk nightgown a constant reminder of the sexual arousal that Carla so continually stirred in me. Chapter 16 Wakey, Wakey, Darling, were Carla's words next morning as she entered my bedroom with a breakfast tray. I looked guiltily at the clock, suddenly realizing I must have slept in. She arranged the pillows behind me and helped me to sit up before treating me to a light kiss as she placed the tray over my lap. 
You looked so angelic with such a sweet smile on your face that I could not bring myself to wake you earlier, but I do have to go to work in ten minutes I must have been dreaming of you, I ventured. I certainly hope so. I'm expecting a positive answer this evening. Can I expect it before or after the play? I'll decide that later. Maybe I should keep you guessing for a few more days. After all I could become accustomed to having my breakfast in bed. There do seem to be advantages in keeping you in suspense. Carla's smile faded somewhat. You wouldn't really, would you? She asked in a concerned tone of voice. Of course not, silly. Can't you see I'm just teasing? Her smile returned. Kiss me again, and then go, before you're late for work. She sighed and leaned over to comply. With Carla off to work I finished my breakfast before rising to shave and dress. My delight in donning lingerie and a dress was unabated though the novelty had worn off to some degree. Fully clad and with makeup in place I donned an apron and tidied the apartment. When the dishes were done and the bed made I hauled out the vacuum cleaner and ran it around before finally sitting down at the desk to examine the words written by Carla the evening before. After reading them through several times I picked up the pen and started to write. Marriage contract between Carla Thomas and Dale Roberts. The parties named agreed to marry under the following conditions. 1. I, Carla Thomas, agree that I will accept and fulfill all of the responsibilities and duties traditionally expected of a husband, including that of financial support, and will render unto Dale all rights, privileges, and respect traditionally enjoyed by a wife. 2. I, Dale Roberts, agree that I will accept and fulfill all of the responsibilities and duties traditionally expected of a wife, including management of the household, and will render unto Carla all the rights, privileges, and respect traditionally enjoyed by a husband. 3. Regardless of the actual words used in the ceremony, the vows taken by each of the parties shall be deemed to include the following. I, Carla, promise that I will love, honor, and cherish Dale, and forsaking all others will keep myself only unto him so long as we both shall live. I, Dale, promise that I will love, honor, and obey Carla, and forsaking all others will keep myself only unto her so long as we both shall live. For this contract shall be subject to any real limitations imposed by the sex of the parties. E.g. Childbirth 5. The parties shall adopt the surname Thomas. After pondering carefully whether I was forgetting any needed clause, I carefully wrote out two copies by hand, adding Carla's words of the previous evening as item 6. Satisfied, I folded the documents carefully, placed them in my purse, and began to consider what to serve for supper and what to wear to the play that evening. Wednesday's supper was not as elegant as that of the previous day, but Carla pronounced herself satisfied which pleased me very much. My ego was further built up by her compliments on my appearance as we left for the opera house. As we laughed uproariously through the performance of Goodbye Charlie, I envied the couples in the audience who were openly holding hands or otherwise showing affection, regretting that Carla and I were forced to act the part of girlfriends only. She must have felt the same way because she stopped the car on a deserted street on the way home in order to lean over and kiss me. I responded vigorously but she started the motor again and drove on, reminding me that dressed as we were we must not be seen doing what we wanted so much. She did hold my hand for the remainder of the drive. Inside the apartment we were quickly in each other's arms. This time Carla led the way to the Chesterfield and began running her hand up and down my body while her tongue sought mine in a passionate kiss. As I began to moan with desire she asked if I was ready with my answer to her proposal. My answer will be yes, darling. I fought off her renewed kiss and gasped out, if you accept my conditions. I wriggled away to find my purse and hand over the paper I had written that morning. She read it silently, glancing up at me once or twice out of the corner of her eye. Love, honor, and obey, she repeated quizzically. Are you sure you mean that? Isn't that what I've been doing ever since we met? I parried. Carla stood up and took me in her arms again. My sweet darling, I accept your terms. Her left hand went behind my head and her right arm circled my waist. My head was bent back for me to receive the deepest, most passionate kiss of my life. 
I trembled with pleasure and arousal. Carlos straightened me up and stepped back. I shall try very hard to be worthy of your love, my sweet Dale, she added speaking quietly and seriously. You must really love me to offer yourself so completely. From the pocket of her jacket she took out a small package, opened it, and taking my left hand in hers placed a diamond engagement ring on my finger. Do you like it? Oh, Carla, it's lovely, I exclaimed, almost choking with emotion and with tears running down my cheeks. Carla sat me down on a chair and knelt facing me. I chose it myself, but we will go together to pick out the matching wedding bands. I could say nothing further, but nodded through my tears. She continued, now I must leave you for tonight. Tomorrow we will have a lot to talk over on the drive to Niagara Falls. Chapter 17 That exciting night was over a week ago, but already our plans are falling into place. Carla has obtained a transfer to the West Coast where we will go immediately after our honeymoon. It was fun preparing to fly back to close my apartment and quit my job. The clerk in the wig boutique was amused when we asked for a hairpiece which would cover my permanent wave and allow me to masquerade as a man. My copy of our notarized marriage contract sits in a safety deposit box rented in the name of Dale Thomas. Tomorrow morning an operator is coming to the apartment to begin electrolysis on my beard. Eventually shaving will be unnecessary and I will be able to wear less makeup. Our wedding will be private, just the two of us before a justice of the peace. I will have to dress as a man and wear my special hairpiece for the ceremony. Afterwards we will come back to the apartment so I can change before we leave on our honeymoon. It will be awkward not to be able to pose openly as a married couple but we will manage by calling ourselves sisters-in-law and pretending that our husbands are away or separated. I will be able to serve as the hostess and helpmate that Carla needs to continue her success in business, and she will provide me with the security and direction that I must always have been seeking without knowing it. I am waiting impatiently for that rapidly approaching day when Carla can no longer call me her little virgin.